And welcome back, this time part two of chapter three. So it should say at the top, mo the most important characteristics for team members uh, or characterizers, I guess, would work. You want them to, the team members to have the high quality skills. So when you have a finance team or a budget team, you want them to be good at what they're doing. Or a quality management team, you want them to have some experience in quality assurance or quality engineering, perhaps. Uh, risk management, you want them to have a background in assessing, uh, w which means determining, then analyzing and addressing risks within your project. So you want them to be goal oriented. You want them to be problem solvers and team builders, right? Have a good sense of self-esteem. And yet I would add to this list, humble. And all of the things that you need from your team members can be grown. So if somebody's close, good. Can you develop them? Is there a course? Is there some mentorship, some one-on-one, -on -one, etc.? That will be your decision. Now, one of the things you have to be aware of as a project manager is what uh, the author Tuckman had said. Uh, he came up with this ladder and he called it forming, storming, norming, and performing. In the end, he adds adjourning. I know it's actually adjourning, but it doesn't rhyme if you say it that way. So forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning, right, is, uh, has been suggested. But Tuckman focused on the first four. And he said, look, anytime you get a team together, they are going to be in the forming stage where you're getting to know each other. You're, learning to, you're looking to learn your roles and responsibilities. That's why you might hand out a charter to them or a work breakdown structure. In storming, people are going to begin to argue over things. And that's not necessarily bad. Storming will happen. The question is how fast do you move through it? And even though you may get to norming, you have to wonder, will my team fall back into storming? So as a project manager, besides driving the triple constraint, you are looking to guide your team to number four, which is high performing. A high performing team knows what's due before it's required, gives it to whoever the next individual is before they even ask. I mean, that's high performing. Uh, in storming, uh, that will happen for a lot of reasons. One, people are trying to clarify their roles and responsibilities. Maybe they weren't articulated well early on. Uh, people will also tend to debate over a technical um, procedure. Um, I used to think personality would be number one. It's not. In studies, um, it's usually like number seven. It's resourcing, it's roles and responsibilities, it's the schedule or technical um, debates that usually lead the way. So be aware of that. Your team will go through this. Uh, you want to move them to high performing quickly. And so you'll have to deal with obstacles. And remember we said the very definition of a project is that it's unique and time bound. So it is unique. Uh, it's never been done before like this, in this context, with this budget, with these constraints, with this client, etc. Otherwise it's operations, right? So it is unique and you will look for new obstacles. So I would go and pull a book off the shelf of an old project, maybe last year, similar to this one, gives me a good head start but it does not define my project. And look to deal with those obstacles as you work through Tuckman's uh, stages. One of the big obstacles you're gonna have as a project manager is called scope creep, right? Where people, stakeholders keep coming to you and adding scope, adding scope. Hey, wouldn't it be neat if this widget could do this? Great, I'll add it. Wouldn't it be neat if this widget could do that? Great, I'll add it everybody's got their pet or we'd call them sacred cows last week right uh avoid scope creep that's why you take the business case boil it down to a charter and then into a detailed project plan you don't violate those sometimes you have to say that is not within the charter or the project plan what i usually say is to people is hey go back uh do a change request and let me know why you think that's a good idea. And then we'll consider it, but it doesn't often get uh, accepted. Scope creep. Two other concepts you could look up on your own that are related is scope change 
and uh, scope gap. You could look those up. Scope creep, scope change, and scope gap. You might want to pause and make some notes. It's a great, great material. Now, I will say the number one reason by research that projects fail is one of those three, scope creep, scope change, or scope gap. Either scope was identified but not followed through to the end, or scope uh, wasn't identified until it was too late and the project fails. So be aware of those. Uh, more obstacles include resource management, of course. Even though you have a resource scheduled, are they sick? Are they deploying now? Is there another reason they can't come? Did they have to give you a substitute, right? The list can go on and on. And you'll want to stay ahead of those by constantly communicating your value, uh, also your needs with the functional managers, etc. It's one reason we have a lot of meetings. And of course, I've said you're always making trade-offs uh, in your project, right? So uh, as they list at the top, the triple constraint, cost, time, and scope, or, or budget, schedule, and requirements might be another way to say that. Uh, and you might have some other knowledge area or ancillary goals that you're making trade-offs. You might also be working on multiple projects, uh, which is going to divide your time as well um, along the way. And so the uh, project objectives become very important. Now this chart was from the book. Uh, it's a good one and they, they do have some justification there, but it's uh, old and I'm not sure I agree with it. So uh, frankly, the number one issue in any project tends to be the schedule because the schedule is the ultimate impact of cost and scope, right? So be aware of the schedule. It will keep you up at night. But make sure you read uh, what they offer in the book because it's valuable. I just think the world is uh, changing. Uh, and, so, and that's part of keeping a balanced outlook as a project manager, right? Take what I say, take what the book says, and begin to apply it because every company, every culture, every um, deliverable is different, every client. And you'll want to have all these tools to integrate them uh, to manage technical problems or stakeholder mood swings or uh, maybe having to uh, uh, delicately sell an idea. Because 90% of what you do as a project manager is communication. It's, it's what you do. Your team, your project team is doing most of the day-to-day -day work, building work to breakdown schedule, structure rather, uh, building your budget, building out your schedule and your activities that go with it, building out your risk analysis, including identification of risks. Uh, it's you that is responsible as they brief you to integrate all of it into a single whole and to communicate constantly with stakeholders. Even if you have a change that's approved or even if it's not approved, communicate with the stakeholders. Tell them why. People don't mind not uh, being told no if they understand why in context. What they really get upset about, uh, a key stakeholder, is if the answer is no and nobody told them, for example. Okay, And so part of that will involve some serious tools like negotiation. There is a book that I recommend for everyone that's serious about negotiation and it's called Getting to Yes. And there are lots of getting to type books. They're short, 50, 60, 80 pages. And uh, it's everything you need to know to get to, yes, really fabulous resource. You can get it on Amazon or your local bookstore. And so it's about acquiring, uh, you're going to negotiate your resources, some of them. Some of them will be assigned. Uh, you're going to negotiate motivation, figuring out what motivates people and the tools you can use then to further deal with it. Uh, what about dealing with obstacles that come up, right? Might you negotiate a, a solution? Uh, for example, uh, we were doing an IT project one time, and we found that one of the things we wanted to accomplish at the end was unachievable this year by some other constraint that nobody would know. 
and after some brainstorming and an agreement with our group vice president and vice president below them we agreed to make that phase two of the project that we would call the project successful at the end of this year with phase one if we accomplished anything else right we're dealing with obstacles and part of that then is making trade-offs uh, that make our deliverable a um, a success if you have failure that's so uh, don't worry about it as much as learn lessons write it down and share it with your other project managers communicate with them right because an effective project manager has to maintain even in failure uh, credibility you have to be sensitive to others uh, display your leadership and management skills always uh, bring ethics to bear and PMI defines ethics as responsibility respect fairness and honesty right would be PMI's approach to ethics right so handle stress right deal with it and so to me the four great pillars that make superior project managers are leadership management technical skills and interpersonal skills this slide really captures it okay from credibility that could be your technical credibility remember you want to be able to at least speak the language or if one of your engineers or technicians says a term you're a aware or comfortable enough to ask the question and of course you want to take care of things administratively to make sure people get paid uh, that things get filed followed up on and tracked uh, interpersonal skills includes political sensitivity technical sensitivity right sometimes these uh, technologists are more sensitive than we prefer it's okay they're geniuses so are we we all have our skill set we bring them to bear uh, great project managers need to have good technical skills but great technologists need to be great at the technical skills but have good project skills vice versa that way we take care of each other and that's being sensitive of course leadership leadership is the art of influence of all the thousands of definitions out there of leadership and there are a lot and they're all very good and accurate in the end leadership is the art of influence which takes on various forms I already mentioned uh, ethics along the way um, yeah and so leadership research would indicate you've got to think strategically be able to communicate uh, get people to work for you right make sure you collect the requirements I uh, do my own stakeholder interviews with key stakeholders those decision makers we mentioned and of course manage your time essential and so there are these competencies that go along with it you have to have a good IQ my you're already there you have to have uh, good management qualities uh, as part of your leadership and you need to have good emotional IQ I will tell you that I, uh, when I was younger, <laughs> younger, I used to get upset when somebody would diss me or not follow through. I wouldn't say anything to them. I wasn't angry uh, to them. But driving home, right, it bothers you. Until later in life, I realized most people mean well. Most people aren't looking to diss me or take down the project or the company they're distracted they have life issues family issues home issues school issues <laughs> like you guys right you're busy right most people just need reminders and that's part of why what a project manager does is continually communicate and so you have to handle your own stress in your emotional IQ and you have to be able to uh, help others manage theirs along the way right so there aren't any really consistent uh, uh, procedures along the way but sometimes we do too much or the need to achieve and it's about keeping them in balance keeping keeping the team focused on the objectives and how we're gonna get there and of course you'll have to take into account cultural uh, differences along the way so um, which are very important I start meetings especially when I have people from other cultures asking them to share something so we get to know each other and get to understand how we all think and so we can work better so as Tuckman would say we can get to a high performing uh, team okay 
So that and that would include the corporate culture. That's it for chapter three. Let's take a break and go on to chapter four.